know what they say. A little childhood trauma built character. Hello everyone and welcome. I've been wanting to do this for a long time and now's the chance. The list will contain spoilers for chapter 1025 and it is extremely subjective. So you are more than welcome to disagree and discuss in the comments below. And without further ado, let's begin. At number 10, I'm gonna have to put Monkey D Dragon. This is definitely going to be a controversial one. Dragon is the world's most wanted man or the world's worst criminal, whichever one you prefer. Because of his position in an organization that directly threatens the world government, it makes complete sense why he was never a part of Luffy's life. In turn, Luffy himself never really knew or cared who his father was, and it was only Garp who actually revealed to Luffy that he had a father at all. Luffy only saw Dragon for the first time after reading the report on Baltigo's destruction, and that was two years later. In fact, Luffy paid more attention towards his sworn brother Sabu than he did to his father. From Dragon's perspective, he appears to be supportive of Luffy's journey as a pirate, expressing approval of him becoming one at Logetown, and reflecting later on that he hoped for Luffy's pirating career to play a role in the shifting of the world. Not only did he save his son from being captured by Smoker, but he also anticipates eventually reuniting with him in the future. This is something I can definitely respect, not holding your child back, but instead allowing him to be free and choose the journey himself. Furthermore, Dragon still looks back towards the East Blue, reflecting on himself and his origin, and that's something Ivankov has often noted. Other than that though, he remains a controversial father towards myself and the extended opinion of the community over a period of time, and that's why he's on this list. Number 9. Monkey D. Garp. Again, this will be a controversial pick, especially since Garp is my fourth favorite character in the entire series. Now, I can't really talk much about Garp's relationship with Dragon, as there is still barely anything we can use from the story besides simply theorizing. Instead, we can explore to what extent Garp was able to properly raise both Luffy and Ace. Garp, to me, is a tragic character. The duality of man who has to choose either duty or family. Garp shared the same belief as Roger in that a newborn child holds no sin, which is a crucial theme in One Piece considering how many characters are persecuted simply because of their race or lineage, which they have no control over. Garp has shown that he loves his grandchildren, and at least from Luffy that affection is partially returned. Garp also congratulates their successes even if he doesn't approve of their paths, something that others are less likely to do. Garp also always made sure to give Luffy food after the harsh trainings and questionable beatdowns. Finally, Garp knew that Luffy and Ace admired pirates, but he never gave up on them. However, Garp is still a controversial figure, and you can definitely criticize his decision making and avoidance of responsibility. When Dragon gave custody of Luffy towards Garp, he did so because given Dragon's status, he would not be able to properly raise Luffy himself. Garp decides that handing Luffy over to bandits would be the best option, though he does believe somewhat that being a criminal doesn't necessarily label someone as a bad person. But I just wonder if there was a better way of handling things. Ultimately at Marineford, everything good or bad that Garp has done culminated here, and we got to truly see how he felt throughout this whole ordeal. Something I found very sad is that Garp actually wanted Ace to fully accept that Roger was his father. That's why he never really scolded him much for his actions besides becoming a pirate. Not only did Garp feel like he failed himself, but I think he also felt like he failed Roger for not being able to properly uphold the promise made. Number 8. Axe Hand Morgan Not to be confused with the God King Morgans, of course, this version isn't child-friendly. Remember his son? He was a real piece of shit. Let's talk about him a little. Helmeppo used to think that he had a very good relationship with his father. Indeed, before meeting Luffy and Kobe, Helmeppo was taking advantage of his father's position as a tyrannical marine captain to act as he pleased, because he believed that his father would back him up should anything threaten or displease him. To his shock, however, when Helmeppo tried to call for his father for help, Morgan instead smashed his son with the back of his axe hand for trying to order him around revealing that he had no fatherly affection for him whatsoever, and even considered Helmeppo a worthless son not worth hitting. That's something I've never understood. If he's so worthless, then get him out of your sight. Your commissioned officer draft your son into the marines and send him off far away. The military code will break Helmeppo down and build him back up into a much more upstanding individual. Morgan was even willing to kill children, which must have been deeply unsettling. Despite all of this, Helmeppo remained delusional of his relationship with his father, 
and tried to assist him in defeating Luffy by taking Kobe hostage. After Morgan was stripped of his rank and incarcerated, he escaped and took his own son hostage, which I found to be quite ironic and sad. It was at this point that Helenpo finally disowned his father and changed his personality for the better. To this day, we don't know what happened to Morgan, or whether any marines are still trying to pursue him. But let's just say this is the last time we see him. For now. Number 7. Diaz Barrels, ex Drake's father. Sometime in the past, Diaz Barrels used to be a marine officer, but he left to pursue piracy due to unknown reasons. He's on this list because after he became a pirate, he started to physically abuse his son, although Drake continued to follow his father when seeing his goodness in the past as he used to be someone Drake looked up to and aspired to join the marines. Due to the mental and physical abuse he suffered from his father, x Drake was actually undersized for his age and easily mistaken as a child by the Don Quixote pirates. This father and son relationship permanently broke down when 13 years ago, Do Flamingo attacked her hideout, trapping pirates and marines in the birdcage. Drake, who was the only one outside of this so-called containment field, immediately fled, leaving his father behind. Barrelsa's final fate was cursing Drake's absence in her greatest hour of need, after which Doflamingo shot him and used his corpse as a chair, which I find to be a much more fitting example of what he's worth than otherwise. In the present time, x Drake revealed that he holds no grudge against Doflamingo for killing his father, showing to us that Barrels had ultimately lost both his son's love and respect for him. Number 6. Frankie's Parents now we know Frankie was an orphan for quite a bit, but the information concerning his origins are not well defined. What we do know is that when he was young, Frankie's parents, who were pirates, threw him off their ship and into the ocean. He was then rescued by Tom. In chapter 967, Frankie actually encounters the Roger pirates and when Odin invites him to the crew, Frankie quickly refuses, saying he heavily distrusts pirates due to his parents, and also his refusal to become a pirate himself. Despite this, Frankie would eventually become a pirate decades later and set out to sea. Number 5. Yasop A classic case of going to the store to buy cigarettes and never coming back. One of the reasons I put Yasop this high up on the list, in contrast to the other characters who abused or mistreated their child, is because Yasop is practically the earliest example I could really think of and find in terms of the story. All the way back in chapter 25, Yasop explains to Luffy the reasons for leaving his family behind. He's also shown to be very proud of his son, and that's why he kept talking about it to Luffy over and over again. One of the central themes of the story is that your own ambition and dreams are pretty much the most valuable types of treasures you can have, and nothing can hold them back. However, this idea is inherently selfish, and there's something called priorities. Yasop's decision to abandon his wife and son is definitely controversial in the community, and most people want nothing more than for Usopp to punch him in the face when they reunite. Whether that will actually happen or not is debatable though, since Usopp himself greatly respects his father and has inherited his phenomenal marksmanship skills. Another problem is that Usopp was raised by a mother who appreciated Yasop's wild and carefree nature. In fact, she's the one who persuaded him to go and fulfill his dream of becoming a pirate. She also knew that he would never return. It sucks a lot for Usopp to therefore grow up with a sick mother who will die of her illness one day and being able to do nothing about it but lie. When she did die, Usopp suffered a deep loneliness that led him to keep on lying even though there was no longer a reason to do so. It is also unclear as to how well he knows his father, as it was never said when exactly Yasop left. Number 4. Outlook 3 The father of Sabo, Outlook himself is a stereotypical noble and arrogant person who does not care for anyone that is of lesser status than himself, referring to them as trash. This was shown by how he treats Ace and Luffy, even threatening to kill them if Sabo doesn't comply with his demands, and panicking when being quote unquote contaminated by the blood of those lesser. He also strongly believes in the power of money, where he bribed the officer interrogating Sabo so that their family name would not be tarnished by Sabo telling the truth about why he ran away. Besides effectively trapping Sabo in the household, he also ordered him to marry a princess when he grew up, which is one of the reasons he ran away. In essence, Sabo has no right of freedom of choice in Outlook's eyes. Worse still, Outlook has zero confidence in him despite wanting him to return, going as far as to adopt a stepson of higher status in order to have a backup heir, something he almost told Sabo outright. This shows that he does not have very much faith, if any, in his son's success, 
However, his constant attempts to reason with Sabo does indicate despite his actions that he wanted Sabo to succeed as a noble. It's just that his ideals gave him the wrong reasons to care about his son's well-being. Number 3. Kaido Now let me... Ooh, safety first. Do you have a... <laughs> Absolutely. I got a condom right here. Do you know how to use it? <laughs> Kaido's relationship with Yamato was at first rather contradictory, calling his child an idiot but at the same time demanding participation in his party during the fire festival. As time went on, however, it became very clear that Kaido's actually just using Yamato as a tool for his ultimate plan, and any semblance of actual affection seems to be non-existent. For now, that is. What sets Kaido apart from the rest of the people on the list so far is that he goes out of the way to kill anyone who tries to help or show pity on Yamato, regardless whether they're enemy samurai or from his own crew. This is probably because Kaido wants Yamato to learn a life lesson about what it means to fend for yourself and who you choose to align with. But not only is this an incorrect and extreme approach, it also solidifies the opinion of your child hating you. Instead of trying to use justification to explain Kaido's actions, let's instead explore a different concept which is what exactly drives Kaido, beyond good or bad. I personally believe that Kaido is going to be another example of how someone became a product of the environment, warping their view of the world greatly and thus also trying to teach the same to Yamato, but failing in the process because your methods of doing so are completely wrong. During chapter 1025, we got to see a bit more clarification on Kaido's rather cynical and bitter attitude towards the world, and throwing in some child abuse for good measure. We learned that Kaido does indeed have an intent to kill Yamato, and we also now know that she essentially was never meant to possess any sort of freedom or free will whatsoever. Instead, bound by the blood on a race, and towards Kaido's will. Kaido has also shown that he's not very transparent with his child, and what limited information does seep out are only there to serve as a reminder of who she's supposed to be. On a different note, I wonder how differently Kaido would have treated Yamato overall if she kept the whole Oden ordeal a secret. Would it have changed anything in the story, or Kaido's vision of her future? Kaido is also better at taking care of some children that are not his own, this is best seen when we got the Viver cards in SPS Vol. 100 leaks, revealing that Kaido took an Ultium Page 1 into the crew after the father died. Their interactions with Kaido over the course of this arc has been a lot better with what they could get away with as compared to Yamato. At the same time, we should remember that Kaido can still be extremely cruel towards children when he needs to be. In the end, no matter how sad and depressing Kaido's flashback is going to be, it does not absolve the draconian alcoholic treating his own child like trash. And that is why he's number three. <laughs> Kaido may be awful at parenting, but nothing is compared towards one of the worst fathers I've ever witnessed in this anime manga series. Even if Kaido actually kills Yamato, I'm still putting Judge worse than him as a father, and I'll explain why. First of all, Kaido would never stoop to the point that Judge did where he completely stripped his children of their humanity, including empathy. Second of all, he drugged his own kids despite their mother's wishes, even forcing her to undergo the surgery which would instill the modifications, so that they could turn into sociopathic villainous war machines. Third, he created an environment of fear for his eldest daughter Reiju, to prevent her from showing human sympathy to his least favorite child. Additionally, he also tampered Reiju to the point where she is incapable of defying any of his orders, effectively turning her into a slave. As for Sanji, oh boy, Judge has a lot to show. The fact that he blames Sanji for Sora's death and for being born as an unmodified human should already tell you what kind of character he is. Throwing him into the dungeon for over six months forced to wear an iron mask faking his death and essentially to erase him from history, all the while still allowing his other siblings to bully him in the process. Despite all of this, Judge claims that he is not inhumane enough to kill his children, regardless of his feelings toward them. And despite considering Sanji an utterly worthless waste of space and air, and a single blemish in his life, Judge sees it better to condemn him to life imprisonment than putting him to death, which I'll be honest is way worse. When Sanji decided to leave, Judge not only was grateful for this, 
but also allowed it because he believed Sanji would never survive on his own. But that doesn't stop there. As we know, Judge would later return to threaten the few people in Sanji's life that he cared about and force him into a political marriage all for his own ambition to reconquer the North Blue. Judge also had this elaborate plan to make sure that he wouldn't be betrayed after the wedding, but he forgot the iron rule. Do not underestimate the big mama. One of the best scenes ever is just seeing Judge horrified and sinking into despair, crying in the face of imminent doom when he did get betrayed. While crying, Judge was mocked by his children but also saw them simply accepting death without any resistance and even laughing about it. Judge began to accuse that something was wrong with them, making him completely unaware or unable to realize that it was his own selfish actions that removed their capacity to feel emotions. After Judge was rescued, Sanji finally let all his true emotions out towards his father, disowning him in the process. Judge finally recognized the depths of pain that he put him through, and being a bit humbled by Big Mom's betrayal and a debt that he now owed, Judge solemnly promised to never interfere with Sanji's life nor threaten his mentor. Ultimately, Judge did do one good thing in the end, where he offered to fight off the Big Mom pirates to give Sanji and his friends an opening to escape. As of now, it's been over 123 chapters since we last saw them in 902. Their fates are unknown, but they probably escaped since it was stated in the reverie that the German Kingdom lost their privileges. One thing's for sure, Judge is a shitty human being, extremely hypocritical, and definitely deserves his number 2 spot. There is one person I found to be worse than anyone on this list. And it's not so much what he did, but also who it was for and the purpose. This is the story of a foolish man whose base instincts and passion led him to ruin. Meet Bingo. Bald, wealthy, influential enough to live in the flower capital. Bingo is a scumbag who became rich from a criminal scheme where they set fire to citizens' homes. This allowed him to make profit at outrageous prices for the people who died in the fires. Fast forward to a few months before the raid and Bingo's approached by none other than the highest ranking courtesan, Komurasaki. She wanted to have her freedom purchased and would spend her life with him if he managed to pay the very high price. Astonished at this unbelievable offer, Bingo decided on the only approach that his pea-sized brain had to offer. Sell everything and give all the money to her without any legal safeguards. He first gave a down payment. Then he sold his warehouse and all that he owned. That wasn't enough, because the next thing Bingo did was quite possibly the most immoral act I've ever seen yet in this series for something insignificant. He sold his family. Yes, this bald ape really just sold his entire family. Now, what happens to those who get sold in the land of Wano? To answer that question, let's look at what our benevolent leader, the Wisdom King himself had to say. Bingo, in a way, pretty much killed his whole family. Their lives were over as soon as they reached Orochi and Kaido's hands. A fate worse than death. They either were sent to slave away at the Udon mines until they could no more, they may have been turned into sex slaves, or they were simply put to death. And that's just scratching the surface. When Bingo delivered his final payment, Komarasaki revealed that she had spent the money with no intention to be freed. As her subordinates mocked him, he finally realized just how big of a fuck up he did to himself and his family. Later on, Bingo tried to take revenge with his fellow mates Bongo and Bungo. But all that did was have them exiled from the flower capital, completely penniless. There is nothing you can do to redeem this non-human. No father in the entire series of One Piece so far has committed an atrocity of this level just to have a chance at getting some pussy. This is what happens when you take simping too far. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Here are some honorable mentions and I'll see you guys next time. Peace.